young ones. Amen. Uh, some of you have no idea the pressure it is to stand yeah. in front of people to sing. Yeah. Uh, so we thank God for their lives. Amen. This is the beginning of great things to come. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's appreciate Jesus tonight. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, are you ready for the word? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to go straight into the word. Um, I'll try and rush through the message tonight. I want you to prepare your heart because uh, we're going to be going into the communion service and an anointing service. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 10. I read, it says, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Or other translation says, wisdom brings success. And we are blessed by the reading of God's word. I'm continuing and concluding with a message that I have titled, Sharpen, and this is part three. Sharpen, and this is part three. We have already established the importance of sharpening ourselves because we are living in a time and a season where if you don't sharpen yourself, you will be left behind. And so it's important for us to put pressure on ourselves so that we can become sharper and effective in the day and age that we live in. That's why the Bible says that if the ax is dull or if the ax is blunt, then much strength is required. Much strength is required. And if you don't sharpen the edge, then you use more strength because the ax is dull. And like I said yesterday, it is your responsibility to sharpen yourself. Don't wait for someone to come and sharpen you. And if you are not sharpened in the area of your calling, your career, or whatever area you are in, you can't blame anyone. Are you following me? Now, quickly, there are five major areas that as a child of God, you must endeavor to sharpen. And I'm just going to brush through them quickly because we don't have the time for me to give you everything. So number one, number one major area that you must sharpen is you must sharpen your spiritual axe. You must sharpen your spiritual axe. When you sharpen your spiritual axe, you become sensitive. You are quick to hear from God. But if you are dull, then when God speaks, you will not hear him. Number two, you must sharpen your business acts. If you're in business, you must sharpen your business acts. Number three, you must sharpen your relationship acts. Unfortunately, there are many people who don't have interpersonal relationship skills. And you have to sharpen your relationship acts. Number four, you must sharpen your family acts. You must sharpen your family axe. Sharpening the family axe means being a family that's on the cutting edge. Number five, you must sharpen your financial axe. You must sharpen your financial axe. And this is so important and critical. Write this down. When, you sh when your axe is sharpened, you don't struggle to be noticed. When your axe is sharpened, you don't struggle to be noticed. Proverbs chapter 22, 
Verse 29 says, Seest thou a man that is diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Seest thou a man that is what? Diligent. That is sharpened. The word diligent there could also mean a man that is sharpened. A woman that is sharpened. He or she will not stand before mean men. He will stand before kings. Why? Because when your axe is sharpened, you don't struggle to be noticed. How many of you know that a basketball in my hands probably is worth 15,000 pounds? for advertising purposes. But that same basketball in the hands of Michael Jordan is worth a million dollars. What's the difference? Is the same ball, isn't that right? Is the same rubber filled with air, but it's in two different hands. One hand has sharpened its ax, and the other has not. Do you get what I'm saying? So it is your responsibility to sharpen your axe. It's not anyone's respect. It is your responsibility. That's why the Bible says, Seest thou a man that is diligent in his business? If I say, I mentioned a name of a product. The creator of that product's name will come into your mind now. Why? Because that person has been diligent. When you sharpen yourself, you'll be noticed by four groups of people who will require your services. Four groups of people. They are number one, God. Number one is God. Number two is a prophet. Number three is a king. And number four is your father. I call them the four factors. So the first one is the God factor. The second one is a prophet factor. The third one is the king factor. And the fourth one is the father factor. So let's look at them quickly. Number one is the God factor. First Samuel chapter 16 verse 1. First Samuel chapter 16 verse 1. The Bible says that, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? If, it says, Fill thy horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. Who is God talking about? David. How did David get into the picture? Because David was on the desert sharpening himself. You see, like I've always said, it doesn't matter where you are in life. If your axe is sharpened, when you are needed, even on the back side, they will come for you. Amen. Are you following what I'm saying? When you are sharpened, no one can discriminate against you. So even God needed David. David was on the desert. All he was doing was taking care of his father's few sheep. But look, when the time came, God said to Samuel, Feel your horn, go into the house of Jesse, for there I have provided me a king among his sons. Number two is the prophet factor. The prophet factor. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. The Bible says that then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, talking about David, in the midst of his brethren 
and the spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. Amen. That will be your portion from tonight. Amen. When that anointing hits your head tonight, Amen. the spirit of God will come upon you amen. and you'll move forward from today. Amen. Say a good amen. amen. Number three is the king factor. The king factor. Remember we are talking about the fact that when you sharpen yourself, you will be noticed by four groups of people. And these are four groups of people that will propel you into your destiny. Very, very important. The God factor, the prophet factor. Why is the prophet necessary? Because Hosea chapter 12 verse 13 the Bible says that by a prophet, God brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet, Israel was preserved. So it takes a prophet to bring you out and it takes a prophet to preserve you. Glory be to God. So that's why the prophet factor is important. Number three is the king factor. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 19. It says, Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Oh, this is powerful. Now I want you to notice a king is looking for someone who can provide a certain type of services for him. And he couldn't get anybody in the land but a man on the backside of life, on the desert, taking care of a few sheep. If you sharpen yourself, the kings of this world will come looking for you. Amen. Now, don't go blaming anybody and say, oh, nobody is noticing. Just sharpen yourself. Instead of complaining and memory and complaining, when you are given a responsibility, do it to the highest. Are you following what I'm saying? Sharpen yourself. Once you sharpen yourself, the king will come knocking. Amen. That's why Isaiah chapter 60 says, it says the kings are coming to the brightness of your rising. Amen. Are you following? The kings are coming to the brightness of your rise. So until you rise, no king is coming. The kings are coming to the brightness of your rising. That talks about being sharpened. The moment you sharpen yourself, the kings will locate you. When Jesus was born, he was born in a manger. But the Bible says a wise man followed the stars and brought him treasures. They came to worship him, even in the manger. <laughs> Stop giving excuses. So I said, oh, I was born in a manger. It's a family I was born in. Nobody in this family has done anything great. That's why God saved you. So you can do something great. Amen. Number four is the father factor. Number four is the father factor. First Samuel chapter 16 verse 20. The Bible says that and Jesse. Now I want you to notice at this point. David has already been anointed king. To replace Saul. But notice something carefully. The Bible says that. Then Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. Did you see that? This is called the father factor. Now if you connect this scripture you know when David went to the battlefield that's when Goliath showed up and Goliath which represented a challenge propelled him into the kingdom. So when you sharpen yourself, 
the father, your father will notice you. Jacob had how many sons? 11 sons or 12. Right? But guess who was the favorite? Joseph. Why were the rest not the favorite? Because their axe was not sharpened. If in your office, every time your boss needs something, they, your, your office is close to your boss and your boss bypasses your office to the other office, that means your ax is very dull. So it's important for you to sharpen yourself this year. <laughs> Nobody likes to use dull axe. <laughs> Everybody wants a sharp, sharpened axe. I want you to hear me carefully. Nobody wants to use a what? A dull axe. So if you are dull, you'll be left behind. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you are dull, you'll be left behind. If God have to tell you the same thing over and over again, over and the same thing, every day, the same thing, the same thing, that means you are dull. You are spiritually dull. You are not sensitive. Please, don't be dull this year. Amen. Amen. Please don't be dull. You have to be spiritually sensitive. Always ready. Ready to hear, Lord, what are you saying? Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's finish by going into the main text for this series. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, tell with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verse 19 to 22. Your life will never be the same again. Amen. After today, after today, if your life is on the same place, then uh, you, you, are, you are a robot. <laughs> after today, if your life is on the same spot, ah, then no one can help you. There's so much in this series that I can't teach. I need to teach line by line before we get here. But at least we have covered a little bit. But so I want you to get ready because this is the meat part of this message. Amen. 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 So first Samuel chapter 13 from verse 19 to 22. Now, the background of this scripture talks about Saul. Saul, if you remember, in first Samuel chapter 9... He, he, his father, he lost his father's axes. So he went looking for them. And then uh, he asked, is there any seer in this town? And so they went to Samuel. So this was at the point where the children of Israel had rejected the rule of God. They had rejected God from ruling over them. So God orchestrated this to happen. And then in chapter 10, Samuel was, Saul, sorry, was uh, anointed as king, the first king of Israel. So he came back as king in chapter 11. He started reigning. Chapter 12, he started reigning. Then in chapter 13, the Bible tells us that Saul was 30 years old when he became king. And he ruled Israel for 42 years. I want you to notice this. This is very important. He ruled Israel for how many years? 42 years. Now, when Saul became king, there was a battle that was going on. 
the battle was between the Philistines. So when you read chapter 13 from verse 1, the Bible tells us that Saul had 6,000 armies of men with him. Well, he had 5,000 and, 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 and Jonathan, his son, had 1,000 men of war with him. And then they went to battle against the enemies. When they went to battle, the Bible says that the enemies came with a mighty army. The Bible says that the men, the troops that they came with, they were like the sun on the seashore. And when the children of Israel saw the enemy, the Bible says that their heart left them and they scattered. They fled. And when they fled, the Bible says some went into cisterns, some went into pits, some went and hide in thickets. Everybody scattered. Now remember, there were, let's say, technically 6,000 that began with Saul. By the time he realized the people have scattered from 6,000 to only 600 men. Now, when this battle was taking place, the children of Israel were in a position to destroy their, their enemies. But guess what happened? As a result of that, because Saul saw that the people had scattered, Guess what happened? There were two offerings that were supposed to be offered by Samuel the prophet. And there were the fellowship offering and the, I think the burnt offering, two offerings. And it was the responsibility of Samuel to come and offer these burnt sacrifices. But guess what? Because Saul saw that the people had scattered, the people put pressure on him and he offered the sacrifice. Mm. And as a result of that, guess what happened? Samuel came and Samuel said, why did you do this? Why have you done what you're not supposed to do? Because of what you have done, God has taken the kingdom away from you and given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Follow me carefully. But then... So, so that please go with me, let's sacrifice, and, and it happened, the sacrifice happened. Now, at this point, there's been constant warfare going on between the children of Israel, the Hebrews, and the Philistines. Constant battles. Most of the time, the children of Israel were always winning. But when they sin against God and God wants to discipline them, God causes his enemies, their enemies, to win, for them to be under, under slavery or under bondage for some time. So at this point now, the children of the Philistines have realized that every time we go into battle against these people, they are winning. They are winning. But we can't, even though we are more than them, every time we go into battle with them, they are winning. So guess what? They sat down and came up with a strategy or a policy to be able to defeat the children of Israel. I want you to follow me. This is so important. And this policy is still in existence today. I pray that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes to see what I'm talking about. So, with that understanding, 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verse 19. The Bible says, Now, there was no blacksmith or smith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. Why? For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. Mm, mm. Now, there was no blacksmith. There was no craftsman. There was no smith in the whole land of Israel. Now, that means before now, there were smiths. Before now, 
they were blacksmiths. But when the enemy wanted to destroy them, their strategy is these people constantly have two things. Sword and spear. The sword and the spear represents two things. The sword represents the present. The spear represents the future. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. The sword represents your present. The spear represents your future. The blacksmith represents the craftsman. The one who makes, the one who repairs, the one who crafts, the one who sharpens. And the enemy knows that if I can take away the shepherd, what, what did Jesus say? Strike the shepherd and the sheep will what? Scatter. So guess what happened? The Bible says that now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout the whole land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. Lest the children of solution have a present and a future. They become great on the land. Exodus chapter 1 verse 11 the Bible says that and the children of Israel grew more than the children of the Egyptians but yet the children of the Egyptians had dominion over the children of Israel why? because they had the ability to control them we are living in a nation that is a tiny little island called the United Kingdom that gave the entire world a language called English. How did it happen? A tiny little island conquered an entire nation, an entire continent. How did it happen? How did it happen? If somebody knows what you don't know, they'll control you. It has nothing to do with the number. If they have, they know what you don't know, they will control you. That's why Job said, I am not inferior to you. What you know, I know. What your eyes have seen, my eyes have seen it. I am not inferior to you. Now, the reason why you are inferior to him is because he knows something you don't know. Verse 20 of First Samuel chapter 13, the Bible says that, but all the Israelites will go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plow where his mattock and his axe and his sickle. Remember, the Philistine is the enemy. So guess what they did? They took away all the blacksmiths in the land. So now, if the children of Israel want to sharpen their axe, they had to go all the way to the Philistines, to their enemies, to sharpen their axe. And the enemy knows that the only way I can defeat these people is to remove their blacksmith. If I remove the one who manufactures their swords, if I move the one who manufactures their spears, it's just a matter of time. The spears and the swords they have will become old, it will become a cake, and they will not be able to use it. And why is that so? When they bring the axe and the, and the, and the, and the spears and everything that they have to the Philistines, the Philistines know what they have. You can't win against your enemy if your enemy knows the weapons you have. Go check Goliath. Goliath had the nine armors. 
He had all the, the nine gifts. The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, he had all of them. He had a shield, shield of faith. He had a sword. He had a helmet. His feet. He had the belt. Oh, you don't know what's happening. The enemy is the best copycat. <laughs> so I want you to notice what's happening here. Verse 21, the Bible says, And the charge for sharpening was a pin for the plowers, the mattocks, the forks, the axes, and to set the points of the goods. So guess what's happening? The Philistines charges the children of Israel more to sharpen their axes. So if I bought this axe for five pounds and I'm going to sharpen it because they don't want me to have the axe, guess how much they will charge? A thousand pounds. And if I bought this for five pounds and they are charging me a thousand pounds to sharpen it, I'll say, oh, it's not worth it. I'll just throw it away. It's called the Philistine policy. Are you following what I'm saying? This is so important. This is so critical. Verse 22, the Bible says that, and it came about on the day of battle. Oh, I feel like crying. On the day of battle between the children of Israel and the Philistines, the Bible says that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. That means in the entire land, there was no sword there was no spear. There were only two people who had a sword and a spear. That was Jonathan and Saul. How did that happen? Because the Philistines removed the blacksmiths. They removed the producers of swords and spears. Your eyes need to be open. Amen. Amen. This Philistine policy is still on today. There are some things I don't like saying, but sometimes you have to say. In our humility, our children are doing exceptionally well in school. Our, our, our elder child is doing exceptionally well. Then, just last week or so, she said, oh, one of my teachers, she's top in the class, intellectually, top. Not just the class, the whole four, year seven. Number one. I said, one of the teachers said, eh, I'll be good in drama, so I should go and do drama as exams. <laughs> so you see the Philistine policy? Out of the whole school, top of the class intellectually she wanted to go and do drama if they can remove the blacksmith all you have is the dramas the devil is a liar it's not a laughing matter this is what I'm saying is going on today uh, uh, <laughs> We are seeing something happening in this current government where the Prime Minister, Chancellor of the Exchequer, is an Indian, the Minister for Home Office is an Indian. These are the three most powerful offices in this land. Guess what they are doing? They want to remove the minister for home office. I don't know the full details of the story, but this is a Philistine policy going on. 
because the next person, well, we've seen it. The previous prime minister was a home office minister and she became a prime minister. We have seen before in previous governments, the person who was the chancellor of the exchequer became the prime minister. So you watch what's going to happen. After they finish with the home office minister, they are going to take it to the chancellor of the exchequer. It's called the Philistine policy. Because if they can take hold of the blacksmiths, and unfortunately, even in the church, church members fight the blacksmiths. We do everything to remove the blacksmith. Do you know who the blacksmith is in the church? The pastor is a blacksmith. The pastor is a blacksmith. So when you go criticizing the pastor, when you go, this is why I don't like criticizing men of God. Is the spirit of Abel, the spirit of Abel, is it Cain or Abel? Who killed who? Cain, Cain, Cain killed. Cain killed Abel. The spirit of Ape King always is at work, killing, trying to kill the Abels. Are they ready for this, Holy Spirit? Can they handle this? Can you handle what's coming? Are you sure? Look at Second Kings chapter 24. Verse 14, when they came raiding, look at what they went for. When the Philistines, when the enemy comes to raid, look at what they go for. The Bible says that, and he carried all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of Valois, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen the craftsmen there represent the blacksmith. <laughs> and look at what they left. The, the craftsmen and smith. None remain save the poorest sort of the people of the land. You see what they, you see what they left? They left the poorest because the poorest cannot make anything. They can't sharpen nothing. They know the poorest are already fighting among them because poor people always fight among each other. They fight each other. Oh, Father, thank you. Isn't it sad? The Bible says that in the whole land of Israel, there was no sword, neither was there no spear. No one had any except Saul and Jonathan. Who do you think will win if your enemy is coming and they all have spears and swords and you have nothing? What are you going to war with? Stick. You are going to war with stick. That's why when Goliath showed up, no one could face him because there was no blacksmith. No one had a sword. No one had a spear. They were all scared and running away. There were only two people in the land who had a sword and a spear and that was the king and his son. How sad. How sad. That's why I love one thing. Yet in the midst of that, David was sharpening his axe. Guess the axe he had? A sling and a stone. That's why when David came to the battlefield, he had nothing. All he had was a sling and a stone. And the Bible says that David could strung a hair strip miles away. Because David knew that the only way we are going to defeat these people is for me to master at what I have. I don't have a sword. 
I don't have a spear, but I have a stone and I have a sling. If I can sharpen my stone, that's why you have no, you have no excuse. You have no right to, to, to give excuses. Use your stone. Use your sling. That's all you have. Use it. That's all you have. Use it. Perfect it. Polish it. On the day. Do you know what we are doing here? We are polishing our sling and our stone. We are polishing our sling and our stone. A time is coming when billions are gathering. They wonder, where did they show up from? Because we've been on the desert. We did not complain when there were two people. I was pretty like there were a million people. When there were five people, I was pretty like there were 10 million people. What am I doing? I am sharpening my string and my stone. I am sharpening my sling and my stone. I am sharpening my sling and my stone. Because one day a Goliath will show up. And when they show up, I'm going to say, Who oh, is this uncircumcised Philistine defying the army of the Lord? Are you following what I'm saying? That's why when David saw him, David said, he's too big. I can't miss. God is on my side. This is not a time to, 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 to give excuses. This is a day of victory. This is a day of victory. This is a day of testimonies. This is a day of breakthrough. Today is my day of victory. 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 David never said, Goliath, Read the scriptures carefully. Oh, for your information, the Holy Spirit said, next month's prophetic encounter, the theme is unstoppable. <laughs> it's unstoppable. No one can stop us. No one can stop you. All you have is a sling and a stone. But Goliath can't stop you. There was no sword. No, no spear. In the whole of Israel. You might be working today. All they are paying you is 10 pounds an hour. That's your stone and your sling. Sharpen it. Yes. Take it. Gather it. Do some nighttime courses. <laughs> Do a course at night. Perfect yourself. Sharpen your gifts. Put pressure on yourself. It's just a matter of time. When your Goliath shows up, you say, ah. I've been waiting for this opportunity for so long. You know, I've been thinking lately that I begin to realize that all the opportunities God is giving me across the world to go and preach, these are major, major churches of 10,000 plus. And I'm wondering, oh, but God, what's happening? God said, I'm preparing you to where I'm taking you. Are you following what I'm saying? Sharpen your sling. Sharpen your stone. Stop giving excuses. There's so much to teach, but we don't have the time. Finally, as we close, 
God is raising up a new generation of blacksmiths. Blacksmiths in every major area of influence in the world through the church. Number one, blacksmiths in the clothes, shoes, beauty, and fragrance industry. Amen. Say amen. amen. Blacksmiths in the family system. Say amen. amen. Why? Because Jesus said you are the light of the world. Yes. Blacksmiths in the business system. The business industry, when they come, they'll see what we are doing and they say, my God, my God, these people know something. When there was economic crisis in Egypt, who rose up? Joseph. The church. These various things that is going on, if all our children are drummers, where are the scientists? Where are the scientists? Don't allow your children to go the easy route. Put pressure on them. Sharpen them now. Get them to read. Increase their vocabulary. Expand their mind. Let them not. This is what we are giving children opportunity here. They might be shaking here. It's, they, are, they are like the Davids on the desert sharpening themselves. A time is coming when they stand before one million people. What has happened? They have sharpened themselves on the desert. When they see one million people, they say, ah, we used to do this when we were in church. This is what God has been preparing us for. This is where he's what he wants to take us. We already know how to do this. Hallelujah. It's time to sharpen the axe. We need blacksmiths in the educational and economic system. We need blacksmiths in the airline, aviation and technology system. Look at what's happening today. Airlines going bust. Going bankrupt, going into administration. Where are the Christians? Where is the church? Where, where are we? This is not the time to, to go back. It's the time to step forward. We need blacksmiths in the music, media, sports, and film industry. We need Christians who are producing great movies. That we can watch. Decent these days there's no decent movie yeah. anymore. You can't watch any movie. Any movie you watch is either killing, kissing, the other ones we can't say. <laughs> Even cartoons are kissing. I, t I tell my wife the safest part is let me just watch the killing one. As for the killing, I know. <laughs> But the other was, you know. So sometimes you are watching and you have to hold the remote because <laughs> you, can, you have to hold the remote. If you snooze, the time, you know, before, before, the thing they do it gently, you know, before you can predict the scene. You know, they go to a, a restaurant, they eat, they play soft music, it's nighttime, you know. You could, but now you can't. You are there before you realize they are playing Bob Marley. Jamen, I want to jamen with you. Before you realize something is happening. God. Praise God. Even afternoon adverts. Before you realize a man and a man kissing. The devil is a liar. Where are our children? They should be at the BBC. Directing on the top, making decisions on all the major TV channels. Hallelujah. Yeah. What's happening? So I know, so Sundays when we go, they say family movie. I know, as for me, when I sit, in, I sit in that chair, after I've preached powerfully, I will sleep one second. So we go cartoons, even the cartoons, it's not safe. So I tell my wife, me, I just let me just watch the killing movie. <laughs> let me just because the, as for the killing movies, there is not are you following what I'm saying? Praise God. 
But there's nothing decent happening anymore. So we need blacksmiths in the film industry. We need blacksmiths in the political and governmental system. Praise God. And they must come from the church. They must rise from the church. It's time for us to sharpen our tools. Listen, as for me, your pastor, what tools do I have? You are my tools. When you come, my responsibility is to sharpen you. My responsibility is to repair you. Some of you come here damaged. The responsibility of the blacksmith is to repair what has been damaged into the perfect image of God. Are you following what I'm saying? So you are my tools. That's all I have. That's why I will preach to you. I will push you till you become the best God has called you for. Amen. You will serve and say, doesn't pastor see how I'm, I'm, I'm putting in my best? Your best is not enough. It's not enough. Give it God's best. And say, ah, I have done my best. If they don't like it, I've done my best. No, you haven't done your best. You haven't done your best. Do better. Do it in line with God's word. And as you do that, God will bless you. In Jesus' name. Did you receive it today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus a better praise. Hallelujah. Let's rise up on our feet. I want you to talk to God. Talk to God. You've heard the word. There's so much to teach, but we don't have the time. Talk to God. Ask God to help you, to sharpen you. Like David, all you have, all you might have, is a sling and a stone. That's not the time to give up. Sharpen your mind. Feed yourself. Talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. Ask God to sharpen you, to help you. Sharpen us. We refuse to be dull. Sharpen us. We refuse to be dull. Sharpen us. In the name of Jesus. Sharpen us. Sharpen us. Sharpen us. Sharpen our axe. Sharpen our axe. Sharpen us. Sharpen us. Sharpen us. In Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we want to partake of the communion and then we're going to go into the anointing service. Tonight, as you are anointed, you are going to do exploits. As that anointing comes upon you tonight, just like David, the Bible says that and the spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. 
from that day forward. That means the anointing represents taking you forward. The anointing takes you forward. The anointing takes you forward. So tonight, God's anointing is going to take you forward. In the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we decree and declare that this table is set apart, is sanctified, and separated for your use. As we partake of this communion tonight, let healing flow through us. Let everyone that is sick be made whole in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you. We call it down in Jesus' name. The table of the Lord is blessed. Let's partake of it. blood of Jesus speaks better things. Better things, better things, better things. For those of you who are watching, you can also partake of the communion wherever you are. Take a piece of bread, take a juice, orange juice, it is blessed, sanctified. Any vinto diluted with water, and it becomes the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for total healing in Jesus' name. The anointing oil. The anointing oil. Father, we thank you that this oil is separated from natural use into your use. We ask, oh God, as we anoint your people tonight, let your spirit come upon them from today going. In Jesus' name, amen. Come prayerfully. Let's come prayerfully. In Jesus' name.
please begin to pray now. Thank you, Jesus. Begin to pray, begin to pray. Sharpen us, oh God. Sharpen us, oh God. The Spirit of God is coming upon you from this day forward. Speed is coming upon you. Speed. Supernatural speed. Supernatural speed. In the name of Jesus. testimonies that you are birthing out of this prophetic encounter we give you praise may we never remain the same again in Jesus mighty name amen and amen hallelujah 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 we thank God did you receive it in three days of intense time in the world. We thank God for the opportunity he's given us. Maybe another time we can look at this in detail. This series will take us more than two months to just go into. More than two months. But we thank God for what he's given us in Jesus name. Amen. Well we've come to the end of the service tonight. Well, the next prophetic encounter is from the 1st to the 3rd of April, and the theme is Unstoppable. Amen. 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 The theme is Unstoppable. Nothing can stop you Amen. after two. After this, nothing can stop you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So we want to encourage everyone, take two, take two flyers each and use it to invite someone in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go from this place with this confidence and assurance, knowing that you are now shopping Amen. to go and do exploits. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. God bless you. Amen. Don't come to church on Sunday alone. Get on the phone. Remember, this month is what? We are winning its vision. One man, one soul. We are reaching out to the souls out there like never before. Amen. What's going on around the world is an opportunity for you to use it to reach someone to Christ. Amen. Amen. So this Sunday, what's the strategy? Come and see. What's the strategy? Come and see. That's all. Your come and see might bring one. Praise God. Your come and see might bring ten. Praise God. Your come and see my bring hundred. Whichever way, use your come and see strategy. 
and God will reward you in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. God bless you. And to everyone that have served faithfully, God will bless you. Amen. Your life will not be the same after today. Amen. My heart is that God will lift you up so high Amen. that nothing can stop you. Amen. That's my heart. Desire that you will be blessed. Amen. I promise you this. You will be blessed. Amen. I promise you this. You will be blessed. Amen. Beyond human understanding. Amen. When you are coming to the next prophetic encounter, you come with a major testimony. Amen. I say you come with a major testimony Amen. for serving God genuinely with all your heart. Some of you have to cancel your shift last minute. Some of you go to work, you know, for doing all of that. I'm telling you, God will reward you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. See you on Sunday.